There is no sponsor for this video, but if you want to support what I do here on YouTube or you just want the best Lightroom presets on the internet, check out my online store. The link will be down in the description. Comparing the best of the best from Sony, Canon, and Nikon. I've been shooting with the Sony A1 since launch, the R3 since launch, and the Z9 for two months now. And I'm gonna be comparing them in this video, all of them with a 50 millimeter 1.2, all native to their camera body. These cameras are equipped with the most advanced tech from each brand. And in my opinion, none of these cameras just stand out as the king, although the Z9 is probably the king on the spec sheet. I mean, how can you deny that? Especially after firmware 2.0, but what I found is that each camera can do certain things a little better than the other. It's a lot of back and forth here. I am not a sports or wildlife photographer. I have done it in the past, but it's not my area of expertise. So I think I can provide you the most value by sticking to my niche and what I am good at. And that's portraiture and filmmaking, or at least I think I am good. <laughs> and yes, that means that I'm going to do a video just like this one, but specifically for video, so stay tuned for that one. This clip right here shows how the Z9 is built different than the Z6s and Z7s. Those cameras always wanted to focus on the brighter part of the scene when shooting in auto area AF. And I would bet my house that those cameras would have done that here and not focused on Melissa. To be fair, her face is pretty dark here, but like the Sony and Canons have been doing for a while, the Z9 will find the subject and the eyeball even before you have pressed the shutter button and even when their face is in complete shadow actually the z9 can detect the face and the eye from a longer distance a longer range than the sony a1 and the canon r3 the subject tracking on the z9 is very comparable now to the sony and canon's subject tracking you just tap on the rear screen and the subject detection box will track her when her face and I are not visible. So it's almost impossible to miss focus now. I found that the subject tracking is very persistent and very reliable on the Z9 thus far. A couple of things that I wanna mention about the Nikon, it will sometimes detect eyes when there aren't any. I talked about this in my Nikon video about a month ago. The Sony and Canon also do this, so they're not perfect, but they don't do it as often as the Nikon. The hit rate of the Z9 was slightly worse than the Sony and Canon when Melissa was walking by the camera. To be fair, I was shooting at f1.2 and the depth of field is razor thin, but the Canon and Sony were nearly perfect, nearly, almost. So firmware 2.0 for the Nikon Z9 was released shortly after filming this video. And so far it's hard to see if anything has really changed or improved on the photography side of things since it was already so good. So I'll be touching base on that in another video. So the Canon R3, in my opinion, has the most advanced autofocus out of the three. Two reasons why. The eyeball control and the subject detection. They're just on another level. Now, no other camera has a feature like eye control where you can move the focusing point literally with your eyeball. So wherever you, wherever you look is wherever you see the little circle. So this feature isn't very useful for portraits because the subject tracking is already so good. But if there are distractions or multiple people in th the picture, you can just look at the person or whatever you want to focus on without needing to switch over to a different focusing mode, like over to spot AF and then using the joystick to move your focusing point around. The R3 subject detection is also very advanced. The autofocus sizes up the subject and it's always adjusting the box relative to the size of the subject in the viewfinder. It's really cool. Wait till you see how this camera performed when I tested it in video AF. Even though the Sony A1 is the oldest camera out of the three, it's AF is still one of the best, if not the best. It might not have that super intelligent subject detection of the R3 or even the Z9, but anything that I've ever shot with the A1 since I've used it, moving or not, it's, it's, I don't think it's ever really let me down. At the end of the day, I call this one a tie. And I'm not trying to cop out here. I think it's fair. See, cause for portraits, I'm not pushing the AF hard enough to notice any real differences. And even if there is any little advantage, 
one camera might have over another is just not going to be very noticeable. If I was able to build my dream camera right now and they asked me which autofocus you want in this camera, I would without hesitation choose the autofocus of the R3 if that means anything to you. Image quality. It would have probably made more sense to compare the Z9 and the A1 to the Canon R5 for this one because the R3 is 24 megapixels and I didn't want to just switch it out and use the R5, you know? Instead, I'm gonna just judge the output of the R3 on its own. I've been shooting all three cameras pretty consistently and I know that the difference in quality is gonna be nearly identical. That even includes the R5. I took a photo with each camera at this location specifically because of how bright the background was and how dark the foreground was. The amount of dynamic range that I was getting straight out of camera, they all look very similar. That, that wasn't surprising to me. After tugging and pulling at the highlights and shadows, I was able to recover Melissa without introducing much noise. And even after pixel peeping, there is very little difference between the Sony's uncompressed and Nikon's lossless raw files. But there's one trick, one thing that the Z9 has is that it allows you to shoot raw photos in a lossless compression and it has two high efficiency formats. That's basically having a medium raw and a small raw option, which none of the other cameras, the high resolution cameras have. And that's something that people have been asking for when buying a high resolution camera. So in the same spot, I took a photo using all three of Nikon's raw formats using the same settings and everything. In Lightroom with profile corrections disabled, I saw very little difference in the overall quality, color, file flexibility, and even the amount of noise I was getting when I recovered the highlights and shadows. There was only a very slight difference in the noise pattern that's visible in the shadows, like when I'm cropped in 200%. I know that color is also supposed to be affected when shooting compressed, so I even applied one of my favorite Lightroom presets for skin tones on both files. Link to my portrait presets in the description, by the way. And I color graded both files as I would any other photo. I even sent them over to Photoshop and applied a gradient map to them. I did all of this to try and see how much latitude, how far I could push the smaller files to see if there's a catch. But in the end, I could not see any visible difference between the two. This is a huge advantage for the Z9 in my honest opinion. No other high resolution camera gives you this option and not everything that we do is for a magazine or something super important you know take three four hundred photos in a portrait shoot that you're going to post on social media why am i going to shoot 50 megabyte files when i could shoot at 20 megabytes still get all that latitude and everything and you know i could save a lot of a lot of space the canon r3 also delivers a razor sharp image with a ton of dynamic range and file flexibility i've always preferred canon skin tones in the past but now that I shoot all three cameras daily, you just you just cannot decide which one has the better color output based on a couple of scenarios that you see. I found that sometimes I prefer the Nikon files, sometimes I prefer the Sony files. It just all depends on the lighting and the color palette that's in the scene, in the, in the picture. When shooting in the studio, I think the Sony A1 edges this one out for a couple of reasons. It has a 1 400 of a second flash sync speed, which is helpful for many different reasons. You know, it, it gives me more control over the ambient exposure in my studio and even the aperture that I'm using. It helps me with freezing action and allowing me to use my flash more efficiently because I don't have to go into high speed sync every time I go over 1 250th of a second when I need to. I'll tell you what though, the one thing that I hate about using the Sony A1 in the studio, and hates it, actually hates a strong word. The one thing that I dislike about using the Sony A1 or any Sony camera in the studio, it's the rear screen quality. I mean, the reason why I even got a tethering set up here in the first place is because I found that sometimes I would get inaccurate colors on the rear screen. And that's primarily, you know, those orange hues when you're using flash, you're just getting inaccurate skin tones. Also, I wanna be able to impress the person that's in front of the camera, the model, when I show them one of the images that I'm hyped about and that I just took. But they just don't look as good 
on the Sony rear screen versus the much more vibrant and just saturated screens of the R3, Z9, and even the R5. I swear the screens, those screens make images already look edited. With the Z9 and the R3, you know, I like them equally as much in the studio. I think my favorite part is that I charge their batteries as often as I put gas in my car. It's amazing. The integrated vertical grips make vertical shooting a lot more comfortable, which is the reason why I ended up purchasing one for my A1 because I just did not know what I was missing out on. When I'm using RGB constant lighting in the studio, all these cameras have trouble autofocusing with certain colors like blue and orange that I've noticed. I don't know what's up with that, but they stop recognizing the eye and the face and it forces me to use a different focusing mode. Now the Z9 still struggles every now and then, but not as much as the Sony and the Canon that I've noticed. I do really like that the Z9's buttons light up if I'm ever here in the studio shooting in the dark. You know, and it's also my favorite like rear screen hinge combo out of any camera. Shooting landscape or vertical orientation, it's just quicker and easier to flip that screen up to the side for vertical shooting rather than having to rotate the flippy screen all the way around on the R3 and the R5 for vertical orientation. That is the perfect segue into the ergonomics of these cameras. I personally love the look and feel of the Z9 the most, but I think that the A1 and R3 have a couple of huge advantages over the Z9. So when shooting on location, there's just something about a large camera kit that you know attracts the security guards. They just start coming out of the cracks of buildings to tell you that you can't shoot on their property. If you run a gun like me using a camera like the A1 without a battery grip, and this goes for the R5 as well, allows you to be more discreet when in public. And this is very important for an introvert like myself. The R3's advantage is the weight. So it gives you the size and ruggedness of a pro DSLR camera body, but it weighs like a small mirrorless camera versus the Nikon Z9 where it gives you all of that, but then it also weighs like it was made in 2016. If you're not used to having a camera this large, traveling with it can be a hassle. And I hate that I can't fit these large cameras with a lens attached into any of the camera bags that I own without having to do a complete surgery on them and rearrange everything. It's kind of a pain. But you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about taking portraits with cameras designed for sports and wildlife. You know, you're not gonna need all of the buttons and features to do your job. Sometimes simplicity is king. And that's where I give an advantage to the Canon R3 and the R5, the Canon system in general. The way the menus are laid out, the on-screen controls, it allows me to focus more on the process. And if I have to change anything, it's relatively easy to find and change. I'm not saying you can't learn and customize your Z9 to your workflow because you totally can. That goes for Sony as well. But sometimes all of those options and buttons can be a distraction in what should be a simple process. I've been saying this for a while now. The most important factor when choosing one of these high-end cameras is the ecosystem of lenses. So if I could only stay with one of these cameras, it would probably be the A1 because of how many fast primes and fast zooms and third-party options that are available. You know, these camera companies are just gonna keep leapfrogging each other every year. You know, the megapixel race, the 8K race. But as of now, I gotta give my props. The Z9 is giving you everything and even more now with firmware 2.0.
Thank you.